compelling detective story, a cloak and dagger action, and a romantic drama, all these stories were taken from real life. The history of Kazakhstan is inseparable from the world history. Reflections on history, our version. Unknown Dostoevsky. A summer airless evening, vague outlines of stubby timber houses, streets without any lanterns. A person is shuffling along a fairly clean street because the all-absorbing sand doesn't retain dirt. The street is empty, almost lifeless, if it wasn't for the dog's loud bark. An old lady, peeking out from the wicked gate, gave a disapproving look and hissed. Convict. But a slouching, uniformed person hadn't heard a thing. He was mumbling something to himself. Over there, across the fence, no one has a clue that this short and plain person had consigned many of them to eternity. Semipalatinsk, the middle of the 19th century. The scattered episodes of life featured lost letters, a mysterious parcel, a lady's album, and the puzzles of one's family bloodline. In our city, he's written his Semipalatinsk novels and he also worked on The House of the Dead. He'd written up his first chapters and outlines. Out in the streets, packed with tiny houses embedded in the ground, dogs were barking. They're being bred in frightening numbers in provincial towns. We can read what the residents of our city talked about and what was important for them. Dostoevsky's novel is platonic. We don't know anything about him. Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky has some Kipchak ancestry in his genealogy. Chapter 1. Window to the Soul. Would you like to write something about Semipalatinsk? There are some funny things to write about. Once this was the house of postman Lipuhin, now it's Fyodor Dostoevsky Museum. The Dostoevsky family would normally invite their guests up to the living room. This is exactly what we're doing now. The writer had changed four flats in Semipalatinsk. This was his last one. Precisely here, his most unmalicious Semipalatinsk novels, such as The Village of Stepanchikova and Uncle's Dream, had been penned. We are on our way to the first floor. These are open funds. In general, museum archives are not accessible to visitors, but this museum is an exception. Have a look at this mirror. The mirror used to belong to Dostoevsky's work fellow, young drummer Natan Katz, who was often taunted by other soldiers. Fyodor Mikhailovich used to protect him. Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky didn't like injustices, and he disliked it when someone was offended in his presence. He would come to the defense of this person. At that time, Dostoevsky had just come back from a prison in Omsk and lived in the barracks, but he was soon allowed to move in a flat. This wasn't really a flat, but an old lopsided hut with a tall fence and low wicket gate. One had to duck in order to get in. Apparently, it was a historical necessity in case enemies came in to chop the heads off of unwelcome guests. Dostoevsky's only room was dark and sooty. Low ceilings made the room too sulky and requiring a candle even in broad daylight. Cockroaches and fleas were genuine owners of the buildings, crawling up and down the table, the walls and the bed. Eternity was ahead of him. He was exiled forever. All these semi-Palatinsk settings are easily distinguishable in Svidrigailov's monologue from Crime and Punishment. We think of eternity as some idea which is unfathomable. It's something huge, enormous. But why is it necessarily huge? And instead of all this, there will be one single room resembling some village bathhouse, grimy, with spiders lingering in the corners. That's the everlasting eternity. What he went through and who he met, the events of his life in Semipalatinsk can be found in many of his works. There was a moment when he entered the house together with an officer who mistook him for an officer's servant because Dostoevsky was wearing a soldier's uniform. So he threw the jacket on the servant's hands. 
This rings the bell with an episode from The Idiot, when Nastasia Filipovna mistakes Mishkin for a footman. Dostoevsky's best friend in Semipalatinsk was a district attorney, Alexander Vrangil. He was his benefactor and guardian angel. He was 21, whereas Fyodor Mihailovich was 33. But despite the difference in age and social status, they became good friends. Dostoevsky would usually come to Vrangil's home even when the owner was away. Dostoevsky is walking around his living room, speaking in his bead, discussing some of his new ideas, storylines. Then Vrangil comes back, and servant Adam brings in some tableware. He was in a contagiously jovial mood. He would roar with laughter and told me about his uncle's adventures, sang excerpts from the opera. But when he saw how Adam brought in amber-colored sterlet fish soup, he started bothering Adam so that he would serve the meal. Chapter 2. The village of Stepanchikova and others. On the Mali theatre stage are actors from Fyodor Mihailovich's distant life from dusty Semipalatinsk, the village of Stepanchikova and its residents. This is the premiere. He described what he saw around himself. Yes, surely, there were lots of prototypes indeed. But perhaps the most unexpected prototype was the author. There is a version that the lead character in the village of Stepanchikova, freeloader and tyrant, Fama Piskin, is a self caricature This character is somewhat like me. I have put in my soul, my flesh and blood in him, Dostoevsky wrote. Another character of the piece was a kind heart but quite weak Colonel Rastanyov. Perhaps this was attorney Wrangel whose protection, financial among other things, troubled the writer. He used to take him to some elite homes of the time. For instance, he could go to a governor's house and ask for permission to bring common soldier Dostoevsky. He would then get a positive answer, meaning that Dostoevsky could come in casually, without the uniform. It could be done unceremoniously, without the uniform. They would ride on horseback and took long trips to Sembor, to the winter places and the steppe, Wrangel remembered. Dostoevsky visited villages and studied its residents' lifestyle. He liked kumis a lot and thought that the drink was very good for his health. They often visited friends on the Tatar outskirts. There was a Kazakh sergeant, Major Kaukenev, and he had a house in that district. They would often come and visit him. Dostoevsky mentions them as Tenibai and Mendibai. Mendibai was his son. The house of a merchant where Dostoevsky and Wrangel had talked over a cup of tea hasn't been preserved to this day. Instead of that, there is a mosque built by Tenibai. After Dostoevsky left Semipalatinsk for St. Petersburg, the consignee wasn't indicated, but one could assume that it was Tenibai who had sent something to Dostoevsky. When Dostoevsky had some money, he helped the poor in the Tatar provincial areas. They repeatedly went in a carriage to the Tatar region to carry some food and money to the family of one blind Tatar man. There is another legend about some romantic story. It is less known but immortalized by one Tata poet. Ramisa Nigmati wrote a poem that her great grandmother had fallen in love with Dostoevsky. His shadow is now glittering in the wind. The genius of a wonderful power had lived here. This is an excerpt from Ramisa Nigmati's poem. He had another novel in Semipalatinsk, it was very moving. During the first days of his stay in Semipalatinsk, he met a beautiful girl in the market. She was a young girl aged around 17, Yelizaveta Mikhailovna. The affair was platonic as well. The orphan Lisa Nivarotova had been raising two younger sisters. He was a soldier and a convict. However, he tried to help her and even proposed to Yelizaveta. He fell in love with her. She passed away aged 70, unmarried. 
It was in the beginning of this century. She had kept Dostoevsky's letters up until her death and never let anyone read them. When Tukhachevsky occupied Semipalatinsk, the white movement moved into the house where the descendants lived. The Red Army rummaged through the flat, took all the papers, including the ones which belonged to Dostoevsky, and when the descendants said that those were secret letters belonging to the writer, they swept them up, and the letters have never been seen since then. Chapter 3. Mardasev's Chronicles Every provincial person lives like under glass shade. There isn't even the slimmest opportunity to hide something from their dignified fellow citizens. People know you like the palm of their hand. They even know what you don't know about yourself. Knowing everything was, of course, the prerogative of ladies. This is a women's album of the 19th century. One could write down their own and someone else's poems in here. Mm -hmm. Precisely that year, Dostoevsky came to our town. Recollections show that Dostoevsky had something to do with the semi-Palatinsk albums. But what exactly did he write? Maybe it was a review on what had already been penned? For example, a critical opinion on this women's poetry. Youthful years are passing by like the unreturnable stream, and all the worldly pleasures grow pale. It was indecent for a lady of the 19th century to be such an easily amused woman. She had to be thoughtful and languid, enigmatic even. The emergence of the literary man from St. Petersburg, condemned to death some time ago, was of course a great furor among the enigmatic and languid ladies of the local community. Surely they also left their trace in Dostoevsky's works. Lady Maskalova, who thought that she was a tsarina and God, was overbearing and tried to shape the destinies of a tiny town. I think that in our town there were also other Maskalov ladies because he must have had a prototype for his characters. Maskalova was, so to speak, the first lady used as a model for Dostoevsky's literary descriptions. Then followed Maskalova's best friend Antipova and many others. These women were giving some hard time to Fyodor Mikhailovich. Baron Wrangel was a young attorney, unmarried, and of course he was an object of intense interest for semi-Palatinsk women, just like the famed Russian writer Fyodor Dostoevsky. At Wrangel's summer cottage, Fyodor Mikhailovich liked planting flowers. He would send special orders to get seeds from St. Petersburg. Meanwhile, young women would pick up these same flowers, and Fyodor Mikhailovich complained to Wrangel. Dostoevsky's other abode was Kazakov Garden. It stood around here on the Irtysh riverside, and Wrangel used to rent the summer house. Fyodor Mikhailovich lived there in spring and summer. There were lots of snakes, and women of Semipalatinsk didn't bother them over there, so they could converse peacefully with each other and have men's talks. Wrangel had a romantic drama. He had unrequited love for someone known as Miss X. Dostoevsky at that time had an almost infernal affair with Maria Isaiva. Those were male talks on Irtysh Riverside, the fateful river of the writer. Dostoevsky's mother was born to an old family of Rtyshivs and was of Kipchak ancestry. The names originate from the river Irtysh, but in fact Irtysh was the place where Kipchak Confederation was centered. He went back to basics. Such were the twists of his fate. Everything here was nice and tender to me. The hot sun in the endless blue sky and the distant Kyrgyz song reaching out from the Kyrgyz river bank. Epilogue. Lifelong mystery. Many of his pieces are like mirrors that went hazy with time and reflect Semipalatinsk life. Dostoevsky didn't write a lot about this particular stretch of his life. But precisely here, in the sand-covered town, the writer's literary destiny started ticking anew. Since then, Asia became the hope for better changes and recurred in many of his works. Raskolnikov goes eastward to Siberia and gets spiritually revitalized. He wasn't much impressed by natural gems. He was interested in some other things. 
A human being is a mystery, and if one decides to commit their whole life to deciphering it, they shouldn't say that it was a waste of time, Dostoevsky wrote.